In uh, 1938, they had the Munich Pact, which Chamberlain had Hitler sign a piece of paper, and and everybody thought, you know, that uh, there is going to be peace. But the Czechs, before uh, that uh, signing the papers, were ready to fight the Germans. The Czechs were only 15 million people, but they had a tremendous uh, army and also very mobilized, and they were ready to fight Germany. But uh, Chamberlain went to Munich and gave away part of Czechoslovakia to Germany to make peace. So he had Hitler signed that piece of paper that after he gets the Sudetenland, it's going to be peace. But that was just uh, like a jumping point. Because as soon as he uh, got the Sudeten, he started to go into Austria. He took over Austria. And then, you know, uh, the part from Vikam, the Ukrainians took over. And they were in, in charge, I don't know, a few months. And it was very, very bad because they, they said that they're going to finish off all the Jewish people. In Ukraine, I don't know how many people know that they call Karpat or Karpatan. And in the Ukraine, in that time, the local po uh, population, they were Ukrainians. They were in the, they, you have there about two million people. They were all, they were all, uh, eighty percent Ukrainians. Now those Ukrainians went with the Germans against, against the uh, Hungarian, against the, the Czechs, against Russia with the Hungarians, and they made even signs all over the city that we will make from Hungarian. Uh, from, 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 from Jewish uh, meat, Hungarian sausage, and the Czechs will have to eat that. That was the, that was the, 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 the things that they said, that, and they were also rounding up all the Jews, but naturally they have the power because they went with the Germans. So the Germans protect them. And the Czechs couldn't have no power, they, they leave the situation there. So uh, that was the story in, 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 uh, in Karpatoya, what those Ukrainians have done. We were neighbors, we were good neighbors, we tried to be in good terms with them, but unfortunately when the Germans were advancing in Czech, to Russia, to Czechoslovakia, through Czechoslovakia, they changed their, their, their feeling about us. We, have not, we, did, we did, did nothing wrong to them, we tried to be good citizens, we tried to, to do a good job, but they were Nazis and they were anti-Jewish and they were only anti-Jewish because we were Jewish and they had absolutely no sin, no nothing. The Czech treat us like brothers. We have nothing against them. We like, we like them, we know that the, the Masaryk, the Czech president, was a very Jewish friend and every time when he has his birthday, we celebrate his birthday in all the synagogues. But when the Czechs had to move from their way in the Ukraine, the Sichaks came to power. They were nothing but, in my opinion, nothing but murderers. In 1939, the uh, Ukrainian took over the Sichak, which they were named, which they were part of a Nazi group, because the Germans promised them that they would get their own uh, state and they were ready to kill all the Jews. And they were walking around in the village already with sacks to try to rob the Jews. We were handed over to the first, to the Ukrainians, for about, I would say, five months. Right, Michael? Five months. About five months. Then the Hungarians came in to us. At that time, the Hungarians were the savers, the saviors. Why? Because the Ukrainians were going to finish us all off, the Jews. They were also in pact with Hitler. But the Hungarians somehow mastered with Hitler, and they occupied us. 
It was normal, sort of, for a short time. Then little by little, they followed Hitler and his politics, that it has to be as well Judenrein, which means free of Jews. This is where they started to deport at first in 1941 to Poland, to Kamenis Podolsk. In every city, practically in every city that you went, in every city that you, you were in, you could see synagogues and Jewish schools and Jewish libraries and, and Jewish uh, life uh, flourishing. But the minute that Hungarian come into to Karpatoyo, the things has changed. You can see that the Jewish, well, I want to ask you one, but I'll tell you one particular thing. When the Jewish people, when the Hungarian go, go, comes into a, to, uh, to Hus, it was a very funny thing. The Jewish people went out and, and they, bring, and they with, with uh, flowers and rooms and, 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 and drinks and, and liquors and, and cake. They were, because we were in terrible situation with the Sichaks, with the Ukrainian uh, uh, strong, uh, uh, strong, we were very much afraid of them. So when the Hungarian comes in, we thought now it's going to be, as you say, a, a savior. So the Jewish people, they went out, and there was between the Hungarian, and that time still in Hungary, it was still Jews and the army, and they said, don't laugh, don't be happy, you're going to see later on what's going to happen with you. They have been all their life anti-Semites. As we know, Petliura was a leader of them, and the Cossacks and those youngsters who came over and they got, uh, got the, the power in their hand. They tried to do certain things, but to this only occasion, we have been thanking for the Hungarians. They occupied us, otherwise they would kill the Jews. That was on their program. Uh, Germany, when they made a pact with Hungary, they decided to give that part, Carpathia, to Hungary. And we Jewish people were happy that Hungary was coming in because the Ukraines were very bad, you know, to the Jewish people. They were like the saviors to us, the Hungarian. But as soon as they come in, came in, which was March 1939, they had some kind of a new laws coming in that the Jewish people cannot go to higher. Uh, uh, for higher uh, learning and f uh, like for instance I was thrown out from the gymnasium I was going which was a higher uh, uh, learning uh, institution and uh, little by little it started to get worse and worse and then we came into 1941. Even my friends, the best friends, friends from school, all of a sudden we went to chess school. They don't want to talk chess, they want to take chess Hungarian. And they didn't want to have nothing to do with us. When they saw me, they turned away my head, they, their head. And uh, it was very bad, very anti-Semitic. In 1938, I went into the Czech army. Till 1939, the Germans coming in to Czechos occupied Czechoslovakia, and the Hungarian occupied my state, where the name was Karpat Rosland. In 1940, the Hungarian take me right away like in the labor camps. And I was working by the Hungarian, all kind of works. We was built streets, we was building airports, we were building railroads, we were the all dirty works, we was working for them. Till they draft out for two years. After two years, we have to go home. They take us out to the Russian front, and we was working over there for the Germans. We was digging 
bunkers for the German soldiers. While getting back to March 1939, when the Hungarians came in, uh, every week, you know, there was some new rules coming out, and it was getting, like, you know, worse and worse. And the Ukraine population take adva took advantage of these laws, and uh, they really were bad to the Jewish people. Uh, sometimes they used to uh, rob them, or they used to beat up the Jewish people, and there was ne really no way you could uh, sue them, because uh, uh, they did not enforce those kind of laws, those uh, days. They, uh, you know, if somebody uh, wanted to sue somebody, you know, it was thrown out from court. So uh, you had to, uh, you know, uh, try and avoid all those incidents, if you could. And uh, one incident I remember, that this guy uh, came into my father's store and told my father that uh, he overcharged something for his wife, some peace goods she bought. And my father told him, you know, explained to him that the inflation was going on, and every time he went back to buy the same material, it's always more money. Uh, in other words, he paid more money already, and he had to charge a little more. So he said, uh, I'm going to get back at you. And uh, my father was very uh, scared about it. And so he went for advice to his rabbi. And the rabbi told him, you know, that not to worry, that uh, God will take care of this guy. And it so happened that the guy was called into the army. And after he was in the army a little while, he came home for a weekend furlough uh, with his gun and with his uh, bayonet. And he went into... Uh, one of the taverns there and he got drunk and he started to get into some fight and one of the guys took his bayonet and stabbed him to death. So uh, that was the end of this guy. But uh, there was a lot of incidents where they beat up, you know, the Jewish people and they uh, made, made it very uh, miserable, you know, for them. So I really, you know, once I went away to Budapest, I just didn't want to come back to the same town. And uh, by the way, you know, uh, when I was thrown out from school, I went into, uh, I did, I was not too crazy about helping in the store or being in the store. That was my type of uh, job which I liked. So my father uh, got me into learning a trade. And the trade which I learned was dental, uh, being a dental technician. So when I was in Budapest and I didn't want to go home, at least I had a trade and I could go in and get a job and support myself. I was going to the uh, school, to the public school, to the Czech public school, beside the Cheder, the Jewish Cheder, and after to the high school. Uh, but in high school, the third high school, the Hungarian came in, so the Czech school, the Czech high school, and all the schooling, the public, were dissolved. They sent a letter to the draft at the army, and I had to go to the army, and I was three years in the army. It was very bad. The first day when I, I get in there, they gave a meal, one meal, and it was so bad that I couldn't even eat it, and I cried. I was very afraid of what it happened with me. I couldn't eat the, the food. Describe the anti-Semitism in the Romanian army. Very anti-Semitism. They always 
they didn't call you over your name. They call you on the Jou, Jou, like in, in Romanian, Jidan, Jidan. In, in, in English, it's Jou, Come here, Jou, Jou. We were very anti Semitic. Um, I went to the Romanian school first, and in 1940, the Hungarians occupied that part of uh, Romania. And I continued to go two more years to Hungarian school. And then they stopped, they didn't allow any more Jewish children to go to school. Only till the fourth grade. Nobody higher than fourth grade could go to school. Well, after the Hungarians came into Carpathia in 1939, and the same when they came into northern Romania in August of 1940, the local Jewish population welcomed them. In a lot of cases, they brought flowers, they brought gifts, and they were glad to see them come in because the local Romanian peasants and those local Carpathian Ukraine people were very anti-Semitic. So the older Jewish people had thought that with the Hungarians coming in, it would be like it was in the days of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Now these Jews were wrong because things had happened since then that would make it a different situation altogether. As early as 1920, the Hungarians had already put anti-Jewish laws on the books. And there were a series of laws which were introduced in the legislation in 1938 and in 1939. And these laws, in a way, they mimicked Germany's Nuremberg laws. They spoke of the Jews as a race instead of a religion. They limited them to professions, so they couldn't be doctors or lawyers or reporters or playwrights. They could only do labor jobs or own small businesses. They also made laws that would force them into compulsory labor divisions with the army. Now the laws in regards to the forced labor, they had set up this thing where all males between the ages of 16 and 40 had to do some kind of service for their country. They knew that war was going to occur, so they wanted to make sure that people were going to contribute to the country. And this was kind of like a martial law in a way. And the law was really after the Jews, the Serbians, the Slovaks, the communists, criminals, and other groups that they considered sur subversive. So this law that they put out paved the way to create the labor brigades and gave it some justification. So as soon as the Hungarians move into these areas, first they're welcomed, everything looks good, but then all of a sudden Jewish men are called up to do road building or construction work or build fortifications and they're sent into Hungary and they're sent to the Ukraine in the sent to Yugoslavia to the Boer copper mines. They took me to the, like soldiers, just it was not soldiers. They took us, the Jews, they didn't trust to take in the soldiers, the Hungarian, so we, they call it uh, the Munkasaza. Wait, I'm here, Munkasaza, this is called just Jewish boys, but they gave us shoes and hats. We was working there, not forced, forced, forced labor camp. We were working there in Nagybanya. That is around, I would say, 80, 100 kilometers from us. This was already in the Romanian side. This was Romanian before. When they, Hungarian, take this over the other side, Transylvania. That was the headquarters. Yeah, that was Nagybanya. They took us there, and I was there nine months. After the nine months, they took us to Seged. 
there is next to Seged is Uy Seged. That was that's the second largest city in uh, Hungary. And there I was nine months working, and then from there they took us to Bor. I was making, the, we was making, it was there uh, five thousand, that's around five times four, two thousand people to make a hill, a big hill, you know, to take with the talichkas, how you call it, the, the barrels, the barrels, and took up make it, it took it up there. This was our work for months and months and months. I don't think so. What was the reason for that hill? That the soldiers came, the soldiers, the Hungarian soldiers, came out to learn how to shoot. Yeah, now, firing, firing, firing. Yeah, just the, 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 how they fire, they, if they would have the hill in the back, then people could get killed. This was like a, a, a way, how you call it, a, a vault. Like uh, a wall. It was a practice uh, range, a firing range. The wall yeah. that should happen something. So the soldiers came out, and we, but the way the soldiers came out, I learned to shoot, sharpshooting. Just the Jewish people, they didn't let them do that. We just did, did the work there, the hard work. And then the stone carrying and all kind of stuff to do it. Just from there, we went away. And it's uh, with a boat to Yugoslavia. This is called Borski Rudnik. Rudnik is a coil uh, gram. This is a uh, with a dick. A mine. A mine. Borski mine. Rudnik is a mine. Borski Rudnik, and there we was working there. The copper mine. The copper mine. So just to take out the copper. They took out one and a half kilo gold, the next mine, just didn't pay for them to do it. Just what we had to do, the mine was under, and the engineer said that the, thing, the hill is too heavy to, to take away the whole hill. It was trains and, and uh, to load the hill from here and put it around 20. Like at a yeah, to put it away from there. That shouldn't be too heavy for the mine. The Jewish people was not allowed to work in the inside, just to take away the hill. And then was they brought their Italian people, also around five, six thousand. There was a lot of people there working to take away. This hill was around, I would say, fifteen to twenty kilometers, and this has to be. That's what the Germans made it put away. So I was working in a tunnel in the beginning. They made a tunnel that they should go through before the hill is taken away. From one side to the other side was nine kilometers. And then was windows, if you call it, to go in the tunnel. It was little trains and they bait out the, the from oh. there the ground and the stones. And we have to put it out here. Then we put me in a train. It must done. This is a train. You know, this is a, and they had their train, which is narrower with 10 centimeters like the normal. So I was going to bring in the stuff from Zayachar. That is the, Zayachar is the, place where the tray, tray, the big tray was coming and bring supplied for us. So I had a pretty good job to work, to bring in, to work with this thing. For I worked there two years on this. And after this, there was a lot of other works there. I told you, there was around, uh, I would say, 40, 50,000 people there and more. A lot of works, all kind of works. Just my, I just think, well, my job was, some people, my, no, my department, I was belonging to one department, Kunze, and there I was working, and they, he made me, most of was that they were the, the leader from, the, the, not most of them, like engineer from the train. And I was bringing in the food from, yeah, beginning, before this, I got this job, I was taking the stones, 
to bring stones the chain and they had to bring the stones from one place to the other also with the, with the train I was the working cable. the cable just I was working in the train and, uh, the, tra the machine was with coals you know heated with coals I had a Heitzer is call it uh, what is a Heitzer I was the the feeder was a Heitzer and then was one guy who changed the the sh the shinners, the, the no the the, the railroads. railroads to change where the trail should go. Anyhow, I had a very good work. Then came that we have to go home after three and a half years. The only remains were the elderly people, women and children. There was no way that we could resist in any any way. Although we come from the mountains. And my father knew the mountains very, very well. There was no way that we could hide ourselves in the mountains because of the peasants. They would have given us away. For instance, I got that paper by policeman delivered to my store. Three o'clock in the afternoon, the next day I must be in the town of Ushvorod. It was the name Ushvorod. And next time in the morning, because otherwise if I wouldn't go, I don't know what do you know about it, how dangerous the Hungarian gendarmerie. You know what's a gendarmerie? You, they, they was the, the most dangerous. This is not police, it's worse than police, it's a kind of police. And they have, you know, in the helmets, feathers. And they call it the feather people, Toloshuk in Hungarian. Feathers. I have never seen this. A picture of. So they they was no mercy by then. No mercy. I found out a couple of days later that I was by my own employee. Michael was Somebody uh, Squeal. Somebody squeal. My own, uh, wh whom I employ, employ. Your worker. Yes. He's In my store. Following yeah. A couple of days later, my father came to Ushorod. We have been there about two weeks all together and told me that <coughs> the six days after an I left and I closed my store, chemist store, and gave it the keys to my father. Father, look after the things. Not to open because it had to be, you know, a tradesman. We was talking over the fence. The fence was just a wire. He told me, you know, Rudy, the fifth or the sixth I come, the most dangerous gendarmerie, this, the, it's not police, it's worse than the police. And he stopped in front of my father and he said to my father in Hungary, to give the keys here or you go in the concentration camp. You give here the keys. So my employer was, was, was behind this and he got the keys. Now another thing about the political situation in Hungary is that after the Austro-Hungarian Empire was dissolved, there were a bunch of small right-wing groups, nationalist groups, that began to spread on Hungarian soil. Now, by the late 1920s, there were a good half a dozen of these groups, and they had gained some following and some influential members in 1933, the two largest right-wing groups merged. They were the Hungarian National Socialist Workers' Party and the Hungarian National Socialist Party. And these two groups merged into what would be called the Nialos. That's Hungarian for Arrow Cross. And the Arrow Cross was very similar to Nazi Germany, to the Nazis, and they had a crossed arrows 
as a symbol, like Germany had uh, swastika as a symbol. And they had a lot of important people involved in the Nielos in these early days. And these people were in high places in the Hungarian government. So in the late 30s, when Hungary took over Carpathia, these people were immediately wanting concessions against the Jews, more and more concessions. And they were already pressuring the other people, the non-Neolosh members of the government, to do something about their Jews. Now, after Germany invaded Russia, along with the Hungarians, the first really brutal action was going to take place against the Jewish people who were now under Hungarian control. Now, there were various anti-Semitic factions there in the government, and they never let up on wanting to solve the Jewish problem. So they managed to slip in some legislature that stated that the Jewish people would have to prove their citizenship or leave the country. And this action was directed against Jews who had come in from other countries seeking refuge, and Jews who had been on acquired territories, such as Carpathia, Northern Romania, parts of Yugoslavia. So in the summer of 1941, they rounded up Jew Jewish people, it's estimated about 16,000 Hungarian Jews. They put them in trains, and they sent them up to the border city, which bordered on the Ukraine at that time. It was called Korizmezu. And at Korizmezu, they handed over all these Jews to the Germans. And they said to the Germans, you, you take these Jews. We don't want them. The Germans refused to take the Jews. The Hungarians refused to take them back. They turned the trains around, brought them back into Hungary, and continued to bring more Jews out. So the Germans took all the Jews. They took them by truck, by marching, and partly by train, and brought them to the city of Kamenitz Podolsk. They also rounded up Jews that were in villages around Kamenitz Podolsk, and they made a ghetto there. So all in all, there must have been something like 23,000, 24,000 Jewish people in this ghetto, Kamenitz Podolsk. Now, the Germans held a conference. And the conference was in Vinitsa in their general headquarters. This is like the headquarters for that whole region. And there were members of the Wehrmacht, the German, regular German army. There were SS people there. There were some Hungarian officials. And there was the head of what was called Einsatzgruppen C. Now let me tell you briefly about what the Einsatzgruppen is, because they're going to play a uh, large part, we can say, in what's about to occur at Kamenitz Podolsk. In the spring of 1941, the Germans were preparing to invade Russia. They knew when they conquered more territory that there's going to be people there that they're going to want to kill outright. And they didn't have the gas chambers then. They didn't have all that planned out. So what they were going to do is they were going to create these Einsatz group and special action groups that would become the mobile killing arm of the SS. And each Einsatz group, and there were four of them with letters, group A, group B, C, and D, had about a 1,000 men in each, hand-picked men. They went to a school in southern Germany. They learned what they were going to do, how they were going to kill people. And then they went about doing it. 
and they followed the regular German army in the Waffen SS, that's the combat or the armed SS. This isn't the SS with the death's head that goes in the concentration camps. These are the Nazi SS that actually fight alongside the German army. These people, they come in, that is the Waffen SS and the Wehrmacht, they take over an area, and after they take it over, the Einsatzgruppen moves in, and the Einsatzgruppen rounds up subversive elements of the population, which includes Jewish people and communist officials. They'll make them work a little bit, or maybe they won't. Maybe they'll just take them right out to the woods, dig a ditch, shoot them. So these are the these are the group, the Einsatz group in C, and they're going to take charge of liquidating the Jewish people. Now the Jews are brought in at the beginning of August 41, very late July, and this guy, Jacqueline, at this meeting swears, I'm going to liquidate all the Jewish people by September 1st. They're all going to be liquidated. So right before, like, August 27th to August 28th, they take the Jewish people in Kamenitz Podolsk, and at least 23,000 of them, and they march them 10 kilometers out of town by a river where there's a bunch of bomb craters. They put them in the bomb craters like sardines, and they shoot them with the machine guns. And they put another row in and another row, and they do this all day into the night until they're all killed off. Now it's interesting to note that a few things. One, the Kamenitz Podolsk massacre is the first major massacre to occur in World War II, the Holocaust with Jews dying, that many Jews in one day. Prior to that, hundreds had died in a day, or 10, or 1, or 50, but never had a five-figure been reached in one single day of killing. Another thing is that the Germans and the Hungarian officers, they didn't censor this at all. So word of it leaked out pretty quick, and the foreign press knew about it and in October month of, you know, even though two months later, in New York anyways, it was in the New York Post, it was in the New York Times that Jewish people were massacred in this place. And the Hungarians that had been there alongside the Ukrainian militia and the Einsatz group in C and some other bystanders in the German army and Gestapo, etc., these Hungarians wrote back to their families, they wrote back to their wives and friends, and they told them what they'd seen. And from what evidence we have now, most of these Hungarians were pretty discouraged and dismayed by this. And they did not like the idea of just going right out, you know, shooting a bunch of citizens and unarmed citizens. But later on in Hungary, things would change because when the pro-German Nazis would finally really be in control of Hungary, then their group would commit some acts, very cruel acts, against the Jewish people. But at this time, still, they weren't totally in control. There were pro-Jewish like Jewish sympathizers still in the government. And the Hungarians, although many of them they didn't like Jews. They didn't want to see Jewish people killed like that. You see, when they put this law forth, they figured, well, we're going to get rid of the Jews. But they didn't figure they were going to get killed. They thought they were just going to expel them. And they'd end up in the Ukraine. And they'd work and live there. So as soon as word came back that this is what's happening. The Minister of the Interior in Hungary stopped all the deportations. They have quite a few family from ours, from ours. 
also taken away to Poland. We were lucky. My mother was then in Budapest. She was preparing the papers, and we got to know that this was coming. We were in hiding. My father took us away to seek it. There is his grandfather, grandmother, only grandmother, and pair and family who helped us to survive to, through this. In 1941, I was unfortunately already in the first slave labor camp, but still in Hungary, and that was in, the, in a couple of days, I don't know, we have been first by the border, border between Poland and Hungary. But I have seen, we have seen, so it was with me boys who have seen their parents in the wagons transported to Kamenets Podolsk. You know what was there, I'm sure you, you heard about that place where they was killed. So we didn't believe, but that was always under the pressure of the, the Germans. That was, that was an excuse to the government, to the Hungarian government. They are, without any permission, settled in Hungarian because they called this the Czech Republic was there for 20 years, they just occupied. But this belongs to us because, for instance, I, my mother language is Hungarian. But that was a different Hungarian. There wasn't the question, you are a Jew or you are a Christian. It was people. They were trying to take us away like we were, uh, they claimed that we weren't citizens of Hungary. They were trying to take us away to uh, Poland, but uh, my father uh, luckily uh, went to Budapest and he uh, got some papers which showed that we are citizens of uh, Hungary. So we remained uh, there till 1944. The Hungarian government came out with a law that any Jewish person who has no Hungar hasn't got a Hungarian citizenship uh, has to be sent to Poland. They come from Poland and they have to uh, be sent to Poland. So we got tipped off. The town manager, which was a, a very good friend for my father, came over and told my father, you know, what's going on, and we should get uh, away someplace. So we had a chance to take the train, all of us, and we went to Budapest. We left the house, the store, everything open. And we were away for about uh, I think the whole family for about two months. Now they rounded up all the Jewish people who, were, who did not run away and they took them to Poland to Kamenets Podolsk. And one of my aunts was taken from Hust. They took away my sisters, two sisters and one, and one brother and my mother. During that early time my uncle Kratz Bernie from from uh, from Le, also Ukraine. They were send. Uh, they send uh, a, a Ukraine, a local Ukrainian boy, to come on Spodolsky to try to bring back my sister and my mother and my brother, if it's possible. Now, naturally, this man find my mother and want her to bring back, but she could not take the the road because of her age and because of her, she was not very well. But she encouraged my sister to go. 
So my, he and my sister, they came back through the wilderness to the, to the hills, and it was in the winter, and she, all of a sudden, one morning, she came back to Siget, Marmoro Siget, where my, where my uh, grandfather lived, Schreiter, he lived there, and she came back in a terrible condition. Naturally, we could not, we were afraid to keep her there in, in, in Siget, they sent her away to to lead to the Kratz to her uncle Kratz, and uh, there she stayed there for a while. My father got in touch with one of the pilots in Budapest, who flew that way every week with the mail to Poland, and somehow he got so friendly with this guy that. Uh, he could take packages to my aunt with all kinds of food and medicine and that stuff. And then, you know, after, uh, I don't know, weeks or months, the, one of the daughters was smuggled out from uh, communist dogs to back to us, but the mother and that a child, that a daughter, was still there in Cabinet Spodolsk. And all of a sudden we heard that uh, they took him away somewhere else in a camp. But the truth was, which we found out after the war, that they were killed, all of them, and thrown into that river there. And my uncle tried to find a Hungarian officer for money, naturally, to bribe him, and he should go up and see what was with my, with my mother. The first time he, he find her, but the second time the neighbors used to say that he took it away, they ended up, and unfortunately, all the group which was living there, all the Jews, they would kill them one by one. It's the same thing with Babi Yar. The Ukrainian poet, he, 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 he condemned the situation and he, you know, he tried to bring up to the world how a kind of a, a big tragedy has happened that for the people who the only reason was that they were Jews. So they, they shot all these Jews? They shot them, all those Jews, all of them, they shot them one, one by one, not even one could, re, could uh, uh, saved themselves from, from that situation. I stayed in Budapest already, and my older sister stayed in Budapest. We didn't want to go back already. And I got a job as a dental technician, and I was working there, and I supported myself, and my sister was working also as a seamstress and she was supporting herself too. They took all the Jewish boys and girls who were born and, and that time uh, 20 years old, between 20 and 45 years old or 50, to labor camp. So I myself also were taken take away in labor camp without any, any protection, without any, any uh, clothing to, to be able to, to go without, with clothes if it's nothing, we took away there and we were going, some of them went to Ukraine to work with, uh, uh, for the Hungarian army, and I went away we, uh, to Hungary. The, uh, after the Donau, we built a, 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 a military camp, an army camp, and I was working there until close to the end, and then they took us away to Austria, and I don't have to tell you what kind of a condition we were there. It's like like the we were with the Nazis used to watch us, so they used to beat us. They used to we, we were really really and and big problem. We take us all to the Russian front, and we was working over there for the Germans. We was digging bunkers for the German soldiers. We was almost a year and a half there till the Russian occupied us and we was we fall in like prisoners to the Russian.
the German was beat us by the work. We was making bunkers, and we have to work day and night for them, with no food, and to beat, and it was SS Germans, Nazis, really SS Nazis, and a lot of people was dying over there, all young people. We was about 250 young boys, and I don't know how much left over, not too much, because the other one was dying over there under the Germans. We have to walk to the work, to walk, we have to walk miles. We didn't have shoes. We didn't have clothes. Everything that we had is gone. And they didn't give us no shoes, no clothes. And we was like, ter we looking terrible. We looking like wild people. No, even sh nobody can shave because he, we don't have even what to shave. So we look terrible thing. We was wild people over there. But the Germans, but they didn't care. They just had one thing in mind to destroy us. And they said that they said to us, "We take you out here. You never will go back life back in your country. You all are supposed to die here. We cannot run away. We cannot run because they they will shoot you right away. They shoot anyway a lot of people over there." They, they shoot people, they told you when you was making the bunkers, they told you not to talk. And when somebody was talking, they shot them right away over there. They just asked you who was talking. So somebody have to say who was talking. They take out the gun and they shot them right away. It was very a suffering thing. When I have to talk and I have to remember uh, everything you know, how, how he was working for the Germans over there and, and, and prisoners in Russia. You have to, to go in snow and to carry wood for bunkers, you know, till you storm it in snow. And he was beating, and you have to carry on your back wood and to build bunkers for them. It was so cold, terrible over there. And a matter of fact, my leg was frozen, both legs. And, I, and, and a German doctor was healed my legs. He cut off the whole skin from the, from the legs. And I feel it even now. When it's a little cold, I feel my legs bothered me. He was lucky that the Russian start occupied us. I mean, not occupied, they start to shoot on the Germans. And the Germans have to left to leave. And we, they captured us over there. In Russia, I was sick. I have typhus, I have malaria, I have my old teeth get loose over there. Because not just me, a lot of people get sick because we don't have enough food. In Russia, I was working in a, in a kitchen, like I had to cook. They take me like uh, I was a meat cutter, so they take me to work and uh, cook. And I used to cook for the prisoners over there. And uh, so uh, my situation in Russia was a little better, like for somebody else, right? But uh, the Russian people, you know, they, they didn't have too much food either for the, for the Russian people either. I cannot blame the Russians. Uh, they didn't want to feed us. They didn't have enough food. They didn't have food for this, for them people either. And then we get, and then after them, we get already American American, uh, from the United States, you get food for the United States. And it was a little better because we get already all kind of thing, uh, products from the United States. So we start to cook a little better. But the first time was very bad. We were sleeping over there in bunkers. And uh, you know, who had a blanket, uh, he was covered with a blanket when, when, when not thousands of people were dying over there of typhus because they cannot help him. Didn't, they didn't have too much doctors. They didn't, didn't have hospitals because in the hospital were the Russian soldiers. So uh, they didn't have medicines. So thousands of people, they, 
wilderness was passing away over there. Every day, every day. You can see him, you was talking to him, and they, he was dying in the snow. We went over there to the shul in Mati Salka. Before, uh, uh, on this was the first the beat us very hard, very bad, very badly in the shul, in the synagogue. And after this, they take us to Kasha. I wasn't in ghetto. 1944, after Pesach, take us to Matisalko. Matisalko take us to Kasha. Over there was a big camp. Oh, we was over there a few days. After this, take us to another place. His name was Aranyida, to work over there. From over there, another four, five weeks later, take us to close to Budapest to work over there. He was working over there in a camp again. Was moni uh, munition over there? We was putting in the cranes in the trains. We are off. We was working over there a few two three months. I don't remember exactly. Have to take us to Arpaloto. Over there, we was working again. We are making bunkers for the for the. Not for the German, for the Hungarian officers. They beat us a few times. Once they beat us, me. Another, we was another few, maybe eight or ten people, beat us very, very, very bad. Take us to the jail because they said uh, we did something, but this was not true. And they beat us, us very, very bad. Uh, to eat, we have what to eat. But uh, it was very bad. Did you get the same kind of food that the army people got? No. We, we, were, set up, we were separate. We didn't, we didn't get the same food. No. Uh, sometimes we, split, uh, we slept outside. Sometimes we slept in the, with the... With the Coos with the with the horses, places, stables. Yes. What are some of the other jobs that you had to do in forced labor? We we always we was working. Uh, Sometimes we take only from here to here to here to one side to the other side, the other side to the, the back to the other side. Only we have to do something. Taking what? Rocks? Yes, rocks, rocks, yes. So they just like made a job for you? Right, right. Some Hungarian soldier guys said, yes. pick this rock up and move it. Right, there. right. If somebody was accidentally, if we have over there, we was working with German soldiers, was much better sometime if it was only Hungarian. Hungarian there was much, much worse for the German. 